Welcome to today's Agile Witness News. We have the illustrious Grady Booch, IBM's chief scientist and a fellow philosopher of concepts and designs in many worlds. We meet today within a virtual environment with the Agile coach and today's host, Agile Bill Krebs, as we explore distributed teams. Grady, you've been a visionary for the many ways that computer software and technology can change the world around us. In your many years of observations, has there been a time that even you have been surprised as to what has been developed? To be honest, no. Um, the way I view it is that the history of computing is very much the history of humanity and one of human needs. And so, insofar as I am astonished, stand in awe, surprised, whatever, about the human experience, I am equally so about the nature of computing. And virtually anything that I've seen, in many ways, follows the beautiful unfolding of the progress of science, but its intersection with the way that humanity co-evolves with it. So the many technical innovations we've seen tell me more about human nature than they do about the technology, uh, in the sense that it tells us a great deal about human curiosity and innovation and just a desire to know and be known and to see how the universe ticks and do as best we can to emulate that. So in that way, I, I'm not surprised by what I've seen in technology because it's a reflection of what I see in humanity. And that's a constant story of fascination for me. You know, it's been 10 years since we started doing um, agile software development. But in your observations of the evolution of software development methods, do you see any method that you feel might be ubiquitous in its use throughout time? Well, it depends upon the semantics of method. As I look back even toward the 40s when I saw uh, people such as Eckert and Mockley and uh, Grace Murray Hopper and John Backus struggling with what we would today call programming, and I compare it to today's practices, it's really remarkable the points of pain that we have to deal with and have had to deal with over the decades. And I think that's not going to change. Fred Brooks has noted there is an essential complexity to software, and I completely agree with his notion. I think that complexity emanates from a number of things that are external to us. It's just the very nature of the complexity of these Turing complete things that we create. And it's added to that the fact that we build these millions and millions of lines of software systems uh, that form these huge dripping hairballs of complexity. So we build our own complexity into it. What appears to be transcendent from those early systems in machine language to the systems we see today, which are more so systems of systems, is I think twofold. And this is something that Ed Feigenbaum and I chatted about recently. Uh, he observed, and I agree with him as well, that in the end, these are all systems built by people. And in the end, it's all ones and zeros at the bottom. So from a methodological perspective, what transcends all of these methods is the reality that we are dealing with problems that dance on the cusp of the technical and the social. And therefore, we can never look at software development as a purely technical problem or a purely social problem, but it's a socio-technical problem. And that's why when I go in and work with projects, some days I show up as an uber geek, some days I show up as a Dr. Phil and slap heads. You got to do both of those kinds of things. What's constant, I think, is just the surprise, the serendipity, uh, the avarice, the curiosity of the human experience that comes into software development. And therefore, over the years, I have seen this pendulum go back and forth between high ceremony processes and low ceremony processes, high ceremony being more of the waterfall kinds of approaches and then the low ceremony being more of the agile approaches. And frankly, neither is the correct answer in general because it must be established and calibrated for the particular domain and the particular domain cul culture at a particular point in time. So if anything, I think what we've learned with methods is it is important to right size them and then ultimately remember that it's always a team sport and that involves all the human activities thereof. Wow. Yeah, it's people are 
key in that. Thank you. Excellent. What message would you give the next generation of software architects? The advice I give all architects is that there are two skills that I find the most important no matter what domain and what development culture you're in. And it's these skills are the ones that I recommend that they nourish within themselves and among their colleagues. The first is out of just the ability to abstract. Um, I think that we don't teach that well in our schools and in the death marches and the daily blocking and tackling that go on within projects, we may aspire to it, but we rarely have the time to do so. The other element that I would advise such architects is that remember that we are developing within a team. And so develop your skills to communicate, to articulate, and above all, to listen. Because as an architect, you must be a leader. And to lead means not just brashly taking the hill or telling others to do it, but also thoughtfully uh, understanding the nature of your team, listening to them, and then making the decision. That's brilliant. You know, I could use that tomorrow. You know, when I go back into my day job and work on that, that's so true. So that's, a, I think, an excellent, excellent insight. Well, speaking of the people factor, you know, our people are smeared across the globe these days. It seems I haven't met a team that's co-located. Everybody's got people offshore or different time zones working at home. What tools can we use for these distributed teams? Uh, I'm thinking virtual worlds here because I know you have some experience in that. Can you talk to me about that? What especially delights me about virtual worlds is that they create the opportunity for serendipitous connection. In a perfect world, you'd like everybody to be in the same room, but we know that's not pragmatically possible. And so we then separate through net meetings and the like. But what you miss in those things is the personal connection, the water cooler conversations. And I believe that's the one of the cool advantages that Virtual Worlds offers because they offer patterns of communication that are deeper than just the sterile ones one will find from desktop to desktop. Yeah, I think that social space is key. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Uh, it's almost management by walking around. I'm not even sure I'd, I'd call it that. That's an element of it. But it's the opportunity for developers to see and be seen and to know one another on a human level. And insofar as you can have those human connections, in my experience, it only makes the technical connections easier. I love that. That's, that's, that's cool. That's brilliant. You've been active in virtual worlds, uh, giving off lectures and office hours to many while in your home in Maui or Denver. Has working remotely in this manner ever made you feel less functional? It's always made me feel more functional. Um, you know, some people get virtual worlds and some people just don't and they never will. But for me, it's a curious thing. And I imagine among the group I'm talking to here, they'll grok this. But I come into a virtual world and I feel fully immersed in that world. It is as if I am in the presence of that place. I think the ability to project myself fully makes it such that that virtual world is just another place. Indeed, given all the travel I do, having a virtual place in an office, and I have a cottage on a, an island in uh, Second Life that's managed by IBM Research, it's the Thornbridge Island, it's actually kind of comforting having a place to go to because as I travel about all over, I can come to that place and it's also home for me. Well, you know, we can sit here with our avatars and, you know, I feel not too distant from you, but in reality, I'm in uh, North Carolina. Where are you now? Um, actually, the short answer to the question is it doesn't matter where I am. Although <laughs> the direct answer to the question is at this moment, I'm in my home in Colorado and I'm sitting in my office staring at a lake and actually watch, watching a family of bald eagle here that are trying to teach their adolescent to fish, it looks like. So to wrap up, as a philosopher traveling the linear timeline of life's perceptions, there are sometimes great shifts in perspectives. You've had a major event with a heart operation. If you could talk to yourself 20 years ago, what would you try to communicate to yourself from today's vantage point? Well, see, what I love about that question is it's, it's amazingly presumptuous because you were assuming that I haven't already gone back in time and done so. Wow. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to sound like a strange question, but I'm not sure there's a single thing I would tell myself. Uh, I have always had a philosophy to live a life with no regrets, 
to live a life that uh, that takes from the banquet of opportunities that is in front of us and not just take but to give as well and to do as best as I can to live joyfully. Um, these are the things that I've tried to live over the years, not perfectly by any means, but I think the last 20 years and even the years before that have been an unfolding of it. Well, Grady, thank you so much for sharing your, you know, your your mind with us, you know, and thank you for being an inspiring leader in our uh, community, not just in the, the software industry, but I think there's more to it than that. Thank you for having me.